Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zacks. I'm your host, Ben Rains. And today we're taking a look at three great dividend stocks to consider buying now and holding amid all of the market turmoil. But before we get into everything, remember to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. And make sure to check out our new Zacks.com plus promo page for a look at some of our services, portfolios, and more. So before we jump into the three stocks, I want to do a little deeper dive into what's going on in the market to give a better sense of why these three stocks might be worth buying, especially for their dividends. So the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ just posted their worst losing streak since 2001 at the end of last week. The benchmark is coming off its seventh straight weekly loss as Wall Street grapples with an onslaught of setbacks that have really ripped through the big retail reports from last week, Target, Walmart, and some others. Uh, Still, the remaining Wall Street bulls are attempting to hold their ground, with the benchmark index once again finding support near that 20% threshold that constitutes the official start of a bear market. So we saw a buyer step in Friday after the S&P 500 fell below that 20% threshold during intraday trading for the second time. And that range now appears to be the line in the sand for now, uh, with stocks back up again on Monday morning. But few will really take solace in this somewhat arbitrary support level, especially when calling a bottom, uh, which is always tricky, has really proven elusive uh, so far this year with the Fed attempting to engineer that quote-unquote soft landing for the economy while trying to tame 40-year high inflation. And then we have, in the background of all this, those dual setbacks of the Russian invasion and the massive COVID lockdowns in major Chinese cities that are continuing to really reverberate throughout nearly every pocket of the economy around the world. And then on Monday morning, uh, a speech by President Joe Biden in Japan kind of caught my eye, and obviously many people in the world's eye. And it could now inflame tensions between the U.S. and China possibly creating another geopolitical headwind down the line. So Biden this morning uh, said that the U.S. would respond militarily to defend Taiwan if China attempted to take the country by force. In the same speech, though, Biden continued to state that the U.S. remains committed to that one China policy. And the White House officials later reiterated that Biden and the country haven't changed anything regarding uh, the China and Taiwan issue. That said, anything on that sense if it starts to escalate in Taiwan when you have Russia, the Chinese lockdowns, it could just create even more chaos. Uh, that said, though, the market didn't appear too worried about Biden's remarks with the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and the Dow all climbing over 1% through mid-afternoon trading on Thursday with the, the Dow up almost 2% near the end of the day. Uh, so looking back to last week with those retail reports, uh, it's it's worth just recapping that because seeing a target, seeing a stock like Target fall 25% in one day, which was its worst one day showing since Black Monday in 1987, is worth kind of delving into a little bit more before we jump into this. So investors hammered Target for its executive team's inability to navigate rising freight costs and more. Alongside its bottom line miss, Wall Street really didn't appreciate the company's decision to absorb higher costs instead of passing them on to consumers. And Wall Street got hit pretty hard for a similar report. So along with uh, the hit to margins, many of the big retailers are dealing with inventory issues and are currently stuck holding too much apparel, furniture, appliances, and much more. So this could lead to a discounting stretch maybe this summer and beyond that. And both Target and Walmart's current year and next year uh, outlooks have slipped since the releases. And obviously seeing that kind of selling from Target, especially in the seventh week of a serious pullback, could signal that Wall Street's really worried about the higher costs uh, remaining in place for some time in at least the near future, driven by those supply chain setbacks. And they're clearly worried that the costs are going to either keep crunching profits and margins or be passed on to customers to eventually drag down spending. And obviously no one wants to hear about that recession word, but we're starting to hear it more and more. And we're seeing... Uh, people start to lower their GDP expectations. We saw JP Morgan lower their expectations for U.S. growth last week for both the second half of this year and 2023. We should also note that uh, the current earnings picture is slowing down, and if it wasn't for the positivity in the oil and energy sector, it would look even worse. But overall, if we look to 2022 
We're calling for about 9% top and bottom line growth on top of big growth last year. And then we're calling for still another 10% growth on the top, or excuse me, on the bottom line next year and 3% top line growth and then another 8% bottom line growth next year on five or in 2024 and then 5% uh, revenue growth. So despite the fears of a slowing economy and a slowing U S economy at the moment, the S and P 500 is still expected to grow this year, next year and in 2024. Uh, so we'll see how those revisions change. And if we start to see those come down for 2022 and 2023, that's when maybe we'll see even more worries about a near term recession and not maybe one in the, somewhat distant future. So with that said, the the tumbling market has certainly been brutal on Wall Street giants and retail investors alike, though that hasn't deterred any retail investors from continuing to buy, just in the sense that there are not many other options to put your money in besides parking it in cash, which with 8.5% inflation might not be the most stable play. Uh, so for those of you who do want to stay in the market, and that has proven long-term to be a pretty great way to for long-term investors to make money by not trying to time things in and out of stocks. Uh, it certainly looks like it's worth investing in some dividend-paying stocks at the moment. And it's really hard to obviously call a bottom. And it's really been proven over the long haul that many investors are the most optimistic to buy stocks and excited to buy stocks as the market is peaking. And then tons of the same investors are really nervous to buy stocks as the market begins. What will Obviously, in retrospect, because you can't really call bottom in in the moment, mark the eventual start of the next bull run. And obviously, never you never know how long this current turmoil is going to last. But if you're a longer term investor and you see great opportunities of stocks that have been beaten down, especially dividend paying ones that are operating businesses that are going to be here for years and years to come, it might not be a bad idea to consider buying some stocks at their current levels, especially with uh, these ones providing some income amid the rising uh, prices and rising interest rates. So the first stock we're going to look at today is AbV with trades in the ticker ABBV. So the company is a pharmaceutical giant that's more diversified than ever, and it's far less exposed to the success of just one of the world's top selling drugs, which is crucial since its Humira biosimilars are available already outside of the U.S. and those are coming, and uh, biosimilars are coming. To the U.S. pretty soon as well. So, AbV acquired Allergen back in 2020 for 63 billion dollars. So, the deal bought Botox and some other popular drugs into a diversified portfolio that features a bunch of other drugs uh, from oncology and neuroscience and a strong R&D pipeline. So, a big diversified pharmaceutical giant. That acquisition is going to help them uh, move forward from the Humira. Biosimilars coming to the market. So the company's revenue soared 38% in 2020, obviously driven by that deal, and then another 23% in 2021 to about $56 billion. Both of those were driven by, in large part by that deal. And with this said, this shows just how important it was to make this deal because those big jumps came even though Humira revenue dropped 10% last year. We should also note that it's adjusted earnings climb 20% last year as well. So most recently, the company topped our Q1 estimates, Q1 earnings estimates on April 29th, with sales up 4% and adjusted earnings up 9%. This growth came despite the fact that Humira revenue uh, fell 3% overall, with uh, sales up 2% in the U.S. and international revenue down, excuse me, 23% for that drug. So the company's earnings outlook has slipped slightly since that release, but still Zach's estimates are calling for its adjusted 2022 earnings to climb about 10.5% on 6.2% higher sales this year. That would see it pull in roughly $60 billion. So in terms of its stock price movement, AbV stock went on a really gigantic run between August of 2019 and the early part of April this year, and including a really big run in the first few months of 2022. So the stock climbed roughly 30% from the start of the year to early April when it hit those new records. And overall, the stock is up about 185% in the last five years, which includes a significant rough patch, but it still blows away the large cap pharma's 95% and the S&P 500's 80%. And then if we look over the past decade, the stock's also greatly outperformed both its large cap pharma industry and the market. It's up 540% large cap pharma's 
270% and the market's roughly 290%. That said, it's now down about 15% from its peaks. It's currently trading at around $150 per share. And then if we look at its valuation, AbV is trading at about 11 Point five times forward 12 month earnings, which also marks a significant discount to its large cap pharma's 15 times forward earnings. And this, despite that outperformance over the rear, the near term and the long haul, this marks a uh, roughly looking at this chart over the last 10 years. AbV is now trading basically right at its median over the last decade at that 11.5 times forward earnings. It's above where it was in. Uh, the last several years at parts, but it's way below where it was uh, for much of the decade in 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. So after that deal came through, uh, we saw the market kind of undervalue that deal and it's starting to, uh, that that climb started to re recalibrate things, but it's still well below its broader industry and at its 10 year median. So that valuation is still pretty solid despite that strong run. Uh, and despite that outperformance and its strong run, AbbVie's dividend is yielding about 3.8% at the moment. This crushes its industry's 2.5% average and the 10-year U.S. Treasury, which is back below 3%. It's at around 2.85% uh, at the moment. The company's also continually lifted that dividend payout. It's up about 250% since its inception in 2013. And... Wall Street remains pretty bullish long-term on the stock with eight of the 14 brokerage recommendations Sachs has at strong buys, with one more sitting at a buy and none below a hold. So if you're a dividend investor looking to add a, a pharmaceutical stock for near-term and long-term growth, AbbVie certainly looks like it's worth considering at the moment. Now we're going to transition on to a, another large-cap dividend payer that operates a in a totally different area of the economy, and that is Union Pacific, which trades on the ticker UNP. So pretty much no matter what the future holds in terms of where the energy sector is going and what the U.S. economy is going to look like in the near and long term, uh, rail is poised to maintain its standing as a key cog in the U.S. and global transportation sectors because of its ability to simply haul an insane amount of cargo pretty efficiently. And the company which we're going to get to is becoming even more efficient. So the industry is mostly private nature also means that companies have invested billions of dollars to ensure that its infrastructure is well maintained, even as lots of the other parts of the U.S. infrastructure become dilapidated and deteriorated. So Union Pacific is a rail and freight titan that's really one of the most logical plays in the broader infrastructure space long term. It links together over 20 states in the western two-thirds of the U.S., uh, helping serve many of the fastest growing cities in the country. And the company also connects Canada's rail system as well. And it's, quote, the only rail serving all six major Mexico gateways. So overall, Union Pacific started to run far fewer trains with far more cars long before the pandemic. The company has transformed through a process known as precision schedule railroading. So this is something that the entire industry is trying to go towards. And the company's management is confident that they could one day produce the lowest ratio of expenses to revenue in the entire industry. So if we look back over the last couple of years, the company's revenue did slip 10% in 2020, driven by that broader economic downturn and lower demand within the energy sector. The company then returned to growth last year following those COVID setbacks with earnings up 21% on 12% higher revenue that saw it climb above its uh, pre-pandemic sales in 2019. The company then topped our first quarter estimates and analysts have since upped their earnings per share outlooks for both 2022 and 2023, even as many sectors across the economy see their bottom lines come under increasing pressure. So with this in mind, it's uh, expected to see its earnings climb another 20 or another 17 percent this year and then 10 percent higher in 2023 with its revenue projected to jump 13 percent this year and then four percent next year and overall the stock has chugged along it's up about 120 percent over the last five years uh, versus its peer groups roughly sideways movement this gap's even wider when looking back over the past decade and it extends to the broader transportation sector as well unp has come under some pressure in the last few months after it hit, hit new highs at the end of March. Uh, the stock is now trading over 20% below its records. And Wall Street 
is a little worried that its fuel costs and labor pressures are going to continue to weigh on the company and the broader economy. So the drop might represent a nice entry point with Union Pacific's uh, Zach's consensus price target sitting about 27% above its current levels. The fast drop has also pushed uh, Union Pacific below both its 200-day and 50-day moving averages, which is a place that it has not stayed for long in the past. It's also just entered some oversold technical levels. So the drawdown in its solid earnings outlook have it trading right at its 10-year median at about 17.9 times forward 12-month earnings, which is a nice entry point as well in terms of valuation. So during this tough market, uh, dividends also provide a boost, and it's uh, raised its dividend, or it's paid a dividend, I should say, for 123 years in a row. And it upped its quarterly payout. Most recently, uh, it upped it 10% back in May. So it's yield sitting at about 2.5% at the moment to easily top the broader transportation industry's 1.2%. And the company repurchased about $2.8 billion worth of its own shares alone back in the first quarter. So it's returning value to shareholders there. So we should also note that uh, the company is really committed to efficiency and modernization, which should help reduce costs and boost profits and also help re return more value to shareholders going forward. And the company is also adding cleaner technologies throughout its operation, which could prove Pretty important as more countries, especially in the U.S., try to move a little bit more towards less uh, uh, carbon-heavy things, so more fuel efficiency. And railroads are already far more fuel efficient than, say, stuff like trucks. So, as I said, the company will be able to play a key role in the economy moving forward. And now we're going to look at a, a company that's in the broader energy sector. And that is Next Era Energy, which trades in the ticker NEE, N-E-E. -E. So Next Era Energy is one of the country's biggest electric utilities and also a leader in renewable energy, which is seemingly a futuristic kind of company. Uh, the firm is one of the largest producers of wind and solar on the planet. And crucially, given the variability of both wind and solar, it's also a global leader in battery storage. And it generates clean, emissions-free electricity from seven commercial nuclear power plants and nuclear which currently accounts for about 20 percent of electricity in the u.s is gaining steam as more countries from china to france and the u.s are starting to once again invest heavily in nuclear as part of a broader cleaner energy future so we should also note that renewables share which if you look on the U.S. government website, it doesn't include nuclear. They're, they're listing it as something separate. So renewable share of electricity generation is a projected soar from 20% at the moment to roughly 40% by 2050 with wind and then solar in particular set to grab a large market share going forward, which obviously all of these trends benefit next era. The company is also coming off two slightly down years, though thankfully its outlook is strong. And we should note that it added uh, lots of backlog in 2021. So looking ahead, uh, its 2022 revenue is projected to surge 29% to blow away its 2019 levels and then climb another 13% higher next year. And then its adjusted earnings are projected to climb about 10% this year and then 9% in 2023 on top of 10% growth last year on the bottom line. And if we look over the last decade, the stock is up about 475% to easily outpace the markets, roughly 290% climb, which is far above the broader energy sector as well. It's also consistently topped our earnings per share estimates, and its 2022 and 2023 estimates have moved higher since it topped our Q1 projections. And as we mentioned, this is more impressive even in the face of those economic headwinds like with Union Pacific. Uh, we should note, though, despite its outperformance overall, uh, the stock is trading about $70 per share at the moment, which gives it about 20% room to run before it hits its current price target. The stock is also trading at around a 33% discount to its own highs at 24.3 times forward 12 month earnings and right below its five year median. So, Wall Street's also super high in the stock with six of the seven brokerage recommendations that we have coming in at strong buys with nothing below a hold. And then in terms of that dividend payout, the board lifted its payout by 10% last quarter. It's currently yielding about 2.4%. 
On top of that, the company said they plan to raise their dividends by 10% per year through at least 2024. So they're committed to uh, continuing to lift that dividend payout as they expand their reach. So that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.